Those who knew Ron Haskell as a teen in Alaska had no idea he might end up at the center of a family tragedy in Texas. To those who knew him in a casual way, Ron Haskell was a normal guy, reasonably amiable and apparently carefree, a father and husband living an unremarkable life. At Chudziak High School, Haskell established himself as a class clown, a bit of a goofball and a flirt who carried his stocky build in a comical way, recalled former classmate Carolee Beckham, whose family lived close to the Haskells in the Mormon community of Eagle River, just outside of Anchorage. He made everyone feel like it was okay to be who you were, Beckham said. Another classmate, Drew Nevitt, remembered mostly Haskell's ever-present humor. In an interview with the Alaska Dispatch News, Nevitt said Haskell was always cracking jokes, and called him the Chris Farley of Eagle River, even if the physical bulk that might prompt such comparisons was still years off. Haskell had a quote in the high school yearbook, Why did they pick me to be class clown? I think it's because I'm so darn good looking. In his senior photograph, he wears a simple white t-shirt and large wire rim glasses, with his hair cut well above the ears and parted down the middle. Haskell was liked and thought of as neither a bully nor a loner. Beckham called him the sort of person who would invite the girl no one else would invite to the big dance. He was named homecoming king in the class of about 400 and was a lineman on the football team. Beckham lost track of him after he graduated in 1999, three years before he married Melanie, but she remembers only the good, like his service in Boy Scouts and in the Mormon Church. Knowing his family was a positive thing for everyone in our community growing up, she said. His brothers were nice, funny. His parents were just good people. I can't even imagine what they are feeling. Knowing him back then, he was the very last person I think anyone would have expected this of. It's not clear when Haskell left Alaska. State records track him applying for a permanent fund dividend given to the state's full-time residents through 2004. He also maintained hunting and fishing licenses from the same period. But by that time he had a wife and growing family in Logan, about 80 miles north of Salt Lake City. The monster inside was known to those who mattered most, especially his wife Melanie, who endured years of abuse and hoped against hope that things might change. Ultimately they did, though only for the worse, culminating the last week in the massacre of her sister's family. On July 9, 2014, a mass shooting occurred in a home located in the town of Spring, Texas, a suburb of Houston, leaving six family members dead, four of them children, and a lone survivor. The suspected shooter, later identified as 33-year-old Ronald Lee Haskell, was apprehended after a standoff that lasted several hours. Haskell was related to the victims by a former marriage. Police and court documents state that Haskell arrived at 7-Eleven, Leaflet Lane dressed American Samoa a FedEx employee. Haskell was reportedly searching for his ex-wife, the sister of the mother living in the home. The door was answered by the mother's 15-year-old daughter who initially didn't recognize him, he asked for her parents and she told him they weren't home. Haskell left, but returned a short time later and told the girl he was her ex-uncle. When she tried to close the door on him, Haskell forced his way inside, tied her up, and made her lie face down. Haskell did the same to the other four children and their parents when they returned to the house. Haskell then reportedly shot all seven people in the back of the head execution style when they wouldn't tell him where his ex-wife was. Five of the victims died at the scene, while one child died shortly after arriving at a hospital. The lone survivor, the 15-year-old girl who initially answered the door, was able to identify the suspect, telling responding police that the gunman was planning on going after other family members. She survived being shot by raising her hand, deflecting the bullet enough to just graze her head, suffering only a skull fracture and an amputated finger, then played dead. Using the girl's information, Police confronted the suspect at a second home, a chase ensued for 20 minutes, involving about two dozen patrol cars and eventually ending at a cul-de-sac located about three miles from the scene of the shooting, shortly before 7 p.m. The police managed to disable the suspect's car with a spike strip, corner him at the cul-de-sac, and block his car with two armored vehicles. The suspect held a pistol to his head and spoke to police via cell phone. Nearby homes were evacuated during the standoff. After around three hours passed, 
the suspect surrendered to police without incident. The victims included 39-year-old Stephen Robert Stay, his wife, 33-year-old Katie Stay, and four of their children, Brian, 13, Emily, 9, Rebecca, 7, and Zachary, 4. The sole survivor was 15-year-old Cassidy Stay, who was able to phone police and inform them that Haskell was planning to attack her grandparents next. She remained in critical condition at Memorial Hermann Hospital, but was released from the hospital on July 11 to survive. Cassidy Stay's survival of the shooting and her participation in Haskell's apprehension have earned her praise from the public. An online fundraiser campaign raised for her received more than 16,000 participants and over $394,000 in donations. Over the past year Haskell's life had been on a sinking trajectory. The family's new home that he had literally helped to build in Smithfield, Utah, just outside of Logan, would not include him. That became clear when Melanie, fed up, finally filed for divorce in October. With the facade of a happy Mormon family shattered, the depression that some say had dogged his life for years increased. Then Melanie decided to leave Utah altogether, looking to a new life in Houston, where her sister and parents lived. Her four children would be surrounded by five happy cousins and people who did not constantly quarrel and fight. Haskell, too, found little reason to remain in Utah. Unemployed and facing a $773 monthly payment for child support, he moved to California, where parents and siblings lived. But in his case it was no happy reunion. Depression and anger grew. There were reports from family members that he would go days without eating or leaving his room in his mother's home. And the violence he had repeatedly shown toward Melanie flared up in November when he reportedly assaulted his sister and mother. Chandra Haskell sought a restraining order to get her brother out of the home. I am afraid that if Ronald remains, he will harm me again, she wrote in her application for the order, which later was dismissed when she did not follow through. Haskell, again, argued with his mother, who had offended him by speaking to his ex-wife. He duct-taped his mom's wrists and taped her arm to a chair, screaming at her and choking her until she passed out. He left the house several hours later, but the police were not called until her daughter arrived. Sheriff's deputies in San Diego County looked for Haskell around the California town of San Marcos, where the family lives. They were still trying to find him days later when they got word that he was in custody in Texas, where his anger had reached the boiling point in a murderous rampage Wednesday afternoon. The victims were Melanie's sister and brother-in-law, Katie and Stephen Stay, and four of their five children. The body count could have been higher had not the Stay's oldest daughter, 15-year-old Cassidy Stay, survived and called the police to report that her ex-uncle was on his way to her grandparents' house. How Haskell's mental state reached the point of gunplay, which had never been mentioned in previous abuse reports to police, may be known only to a few who are close to him, if at all. Melanie's divorce lawyer, a Daniel Barker, was sickened when he learned of the family slaughter. He wonders if he should have seen some indication, even a hint, that Haskell's instability was reaching a new level, and he combed his memory of their times together in court and of his conversations with Melanie. He came up with little. Ron came across with a good demeanor, Barker said. He spoke well and didn't raise his voice. He had that personality where you wouldn't expect something like this to happen. But you also had a feeling there might be something behind that exterior. There was something going on inside him. Only because his client had given him a full accounting of her marital strife was Barker aware of Haskell's potential for violence. When Melanie decided to relocate to Houston and Ron then headed to Southern California, Barker breathed a little easier. Surely that was enough distance between them, he thought. I was more fearful for her safety than with any other client I've had, the lawyer said. Had she still lived in Utah, I would have been more concerned. But he was moving to California, where he would have the support of his family. She was moving to Texas. The problem was that this was someone who was intent on something. You can't plan for crazy. The trip from California to Texas was not nearly as far as the psychological journey Haskell had taken through his adult years. To those who knew him as a teenager in Alaska, there was nothing to suggest what he would become. He was a good kid from a righteous family, 
who were respected for their devotion to the gospel and to the church. On the morning of July 10, 2014, Haskell was charged with six counts of capital murder, according to the Harris County Sheriff's Office. He was held without bond, and made his first court appearance on July 11. In court, as the charges against him were read, he began shaking and later collapsed for reasons that are still unclear. When deputies lifted him to his feet, Haskell stood for a minute, then collapsed again. As a result, he had to be removed from the courtroom in a wheelchair. He made reappearances in court on September 30 and December 2, 2014 and January 21, 2015. On August 26, 2016, Haskell was expected back in court and was then expected to stand trial in the fall of 2017 and face the death penalty. Haskell's trial commenced in August 2019. On September 26 of that year, Haskell was found guilty of capital murder and was sentenced to death by lethal injection on October 11. He is currently on death row at the Allen B. Polonsky unit near Livingston, awaiting execution. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you enjoy these videos, drop a like in there too. Thanks for watching. And if you would like to see a certain video on something, leave it in a comment below. Until next time, stay safe.